Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is quite intense and the way things play out is pretty much unbelievable. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of your guys' thoughts are about this entire case. But before we get into today's video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Berga. Berga is a European tech accessories company and they have so many beautiful designs and they are absolutely perfect for fashion lovers. Not only are their cases and accessories absolutely beautiful, but they also offer protection. They come with a double layer that offers shock absorption to protect your devices. They also have a glossy finish with a scratch resistant coating. I have one of their elite cases. They have cloud guard technology that absorbs up to 90% of impact force and they have raised bezels to protect against your glass shattering even with flat drops. They also have a microfiber lining that protects your phone from the inside and prevents scratches from within. I really like how high quality the images are on each phone case. They also are made with anti-fading printing so that your design will be as vibrant in the months to come as the day you got it. I have the Ubid Jungle as my main case and I absolutely love the design on this one. I really like how it looks like there's just crystals lining the different colors. I love how it's all these different emerald and turquoise colors. I absolutely love this one. I also really like how it has that microfiber lining. I also like that there's pink on the inside, but um, you can see the words, you can see that it's in gold, and it really, really makes it look just so nice, even on the inside of the phone case. I also have the Give Me Butterflies case for my iPad, and I just love this one as well. It's so cute, and I like that there's a little spot to hold my Apple Pencil. I also really love how they come in these super soft microfiber pouches. I have another phone case here that came in this one. It's literally so soft to the touch. I want to keep these around just to put other things in them because of how soft they are. It really is cool how luxurious all of this feels from the time that you're taking it out of the package to the time that you're walking around with this phone case. I absolutely love them. Berga is offering an amazing sale for you guys. When you buy two of their cases, you can get two more absolutely free. Then, when you use my code RACHELSHANNONX15, you can get an additional 15% off of your order. So, make sure you use my link down below at burga.com slash RACHELSHANNONX15 and use my code RACHELSHANNONX15 to get an additional 15% off of your order. Thank you again so much to Burga for sponsoring today's video. So, with all of that being said, let's get into today's case and we will start off by introducing Brett Ryan. Brett Ryan was born on December 30th, 1980 to his parents, Susan and William Ryan. He grew up in Scarborough, Toronto in Canada. Brett had three brothers, two older brothers named Christopher and Leland, and his younger brother was Alexander, who went by AJ. Now, Brett seemed to have a pretty good upbringing and a relatively healthy family life. His father, William, who went by Bill, was known to be relatively introverted and quiet. He worked as a budget manager at the Toronto Star newspaper, and then in addition to this, he spent his free time teaching fitness classes at the local community center. He was very much into living a very healthy and active lifestyle. Brett's mother, Susan, was a stay-at-home mother. She was known to have a bubbly, friendly personality, but she was stern and strict when she needed to be. She loved gardening and keeping a beautiful home. She was a huge baseball fan, especially to the team, the Toronto Blue Jays. When they won the World Series in 1993, she marched up and down the streets, banging pots and pans in celebration. Brett's oldest brother, Chris, worked as a Toronto transit fares collector. He was known to be a shy person who was goofy, funny, and outgoing when he was around his friends and those closest to him. I unfortunately don't have pictures of the other two brothers, but Leland was two and a half years older than Brett, and he was known as the one who was very musically talented and artistic. He loved playing the drums and the guitar. He was really into photography, and he went on to study photography at Ryerson University in Toronto. Then his younger brother, AJ, was six years younger than Brett, and he was known to be incredibly smart. He excelled so much 
much in school that he ended up attending a school for gifted children. He was also very shy and introverted, but he was known to be a sweet, charming young man with a quirky sense of humor. Now, Brett was described as being outgoing and generous, and he made friends easily. He was the outgoing and extroverted one of the family. Brett attended Sir Oliver Mowat High School, graduating in 1997. After high school, he enrolled in the University of Toronto, but school seemed to be too much for Brett. He just seemed to have a rough time in general. He wasn't doing too well in his classes, and he had gone through two really difficult breakups during that time so he ended up dropping out. It seemed that as he was watching his friends building their careers, starting their families, and making names for themselves, Brett was just struggling. He started a summer job as a house painter, but that turned into being his full-time job. At this time, he also found himself in $60,000 worth of debt, and he really didn't have any way of paying this off. So, due to all of these struggles that were just building and building, Brett slipped into a deep depression. But while he was feeling desperate and like he was a failure, he didn't want to admit to anybody that he had failed. He didn't want to admit that he was depressed. He had suffered other small bouts of depression all throughout his life, but he didn't want people to feel bad for him. He wanted to display these behaviors of being this strong and positive person, but deep down, he was really struggling. So, he decided that the only reasonable way to pick himself back up was to make some quick cash, even if he did so illegally. So, by October 20th, 2007, Brett decided to rob a bank. He went to the CIBC, which is a bank located only about eight minutes away from his home. When doing so, he decided that he needed a disguise, obviously. He wrapped his face in a bunch of bandages, and then he put his left arm into a sling and then he walked into the bank with a limp. He walked into the bank carrying a big stack of papers and then when he got to the counter, he slipped the teller a note saying that he had a gun in his sling and he demanded a payout of $2,000. The bank teller quickly handed over the money, but it was only $1,115 but Brett wasn't going to hang around for a while to wait for the proper amount of money. He quickly left the bank without being caught. After getting away with his first bank heist, Brett seemed to have a taste for getting away with these large sums of money. So, over the course of eight months, he robbed another 12 banks in the same area around his neighborhood, stealing amounts of upwards of $28,000. So, during the first two robberies is when he wore those bandages on his face and then the fake sling and then walked with a limp. However, for all of the rest of the robberies, he went with a different disguise. This time, he bought himself a high-quality glue-on beard. He wore that, a Gilligan hat, glasses, a plaid shirt, and a dark jacket to make himself look like an old man. At this time, after wearing this disguise, he was given the nickname of the Bearded Bandit. So, as he was committing all of these different robberies, obviously investigators were trying to figure out who exactly was responsible for committing all of these crimes. Now, because Brett had never committed any other crimes before these robberies, police didn't have his fingerprints on file. So, even though police were lifting fingerprints from the robberies and putting them in the database, they weren't coming up with any matches because they didn't have his fingerprints on file. Then, going off of the pattern of banks that were always being hit, at one point, they had 25 officers sitting outside of different banks in the area, hoping that someone would catch him entering one of these banks so that they could arrest him. But he didn't show up. After one of these robberies, police actually found an external surveillance camera on one of the banks, and they figured out which truck actually belonged to him. So, they were able to trace his truck back to his home. After this, police surveilled him for another two weeks until he attempted his last bank robbery on June 20th, 2008. When Brett arrived to the TD Canada Trust, the 28-year-old got out of his car wearing his beard and walking with a limp. He then walked up to the bank and walked into the door, 
But at this point, he must have had a feeling that something was off because pretty soon after he walked in, he walked right back out to see that police were waiting for him. Of course, he was arrested and taken into custody for all of these robberies. And over the course of the next seven months, he awaited his trial in jail. As Brett awaited trial in jail, friends and family wrote to the courts to vouch for Brett. They all cited how Brett had a stellar background and that they were absolutely shocked by this sudden shift in his behaviors. He volunteered at Sick Kids, a local hospital for sick children. He refed at Little League games at the local community center. He was generous, kind, and had been a productive member of society. He had integrity and he went out of his way to help people on a regular basis. Friends said that this behavior must have been an act of desperation after being down on his luck for years. Brett also went on to say that he was actually relieved when police caught him so that he could stop with this act. By January of 2009, Brett pled guilty to eight counts of robbery and eight counts of wearing a disguise with the intent to commit a crime. For this, he was sentenced to five years with time served. As he did his time in jail, he did undergo a psychiatric evaluation evaluation, this evaluation found that he had no history of aggression or violence. He didn't have any sort of mental illness that could have contributed to his lack of decision-making ability. He didn't have a history of substance abuse or personality disorders, and he didn't exhibit any sort of psychopathic traits. But he did have a history of depression, and depression did actually run in his family. So, after reviewing his case, Brett was granted day parole in April of 2010. This allowed him to work part-time at a Swiss chalet in downtown Toronto. Co-workers described him as being kind, charismatic, and hardworking. He often spent time chatting with the customers and making connections with people. However, there was one coworker where Brett did confide in him about his struggles with depression. Then, by November of 2010, he was granted full parole. Conditions of his parole included that he had to attend therapy in order to address his emotional and relationship issues with his family relationships as well as intimate relationships. He also had to report any romantic relationships that he had with another woman because they identified one of the stressors of him committing these robberies as one of his previous breakups. But on the outside, he was now faced with more financial issues that he didn't have to deal with before. He had to file for bankruptcy, and then finding a job showed to be very difficult. He tried picking his paint business back up, but whenever a client learned about his criminal history, no one really wanted to let him into their homes. But at this time, Brett was determined to turn his life back around. He had a new beginning, and he wanted to make positive changes to his life. So, he started working different retail jobs and he got some financial assistance from his parents. Then, he re-enrolled at the University of Toronto to pursue a biophysics degree. He continued attending therapy and his therapist advised him to be more open and honest with his family and those closest to him. His psychologist said that being more open and honest about his feelings and his struggles, this was the only way that he would be able to avoid getting into trouble trouble again. By September of 2011, one of Brett's friends had set him up on a blind date with a girl named Kristen Baxter. She was a beautiful, blonde, athletic young woman who worked as a physiotherapist. She owned a waterfront condo in Toronto with her Wheaton Terrier Poodle Mix pup. She loved hiking and traveling around with her dog. Her and Brett connected very quickly and began a relationship after that. Pictures of the two of them on social media often showed the two of them going on dates to baseball games, hockey games, going out to dinner, and Brett even went with Kristen's family on a beach vacation to the Bahamas. It now seemed that Brett was finally living the quiet, blissful life that he had envisioned for himself. Kristen was aware of Brett's prior criminal history, but she didn't care about that. He was a new person, and she was in love with him. 
By January of 2013, Brett moved in with Kristen into her condo located in Harborfront in a building across the street from the power plant gallery. From there, the two lived a life that was completely different than the life that Brett knew with his family growing up. His family lived in a quiet, modest home in a suburban neighborhood. Kristen's condo, on the other hand, while it was a little bit small, it had the view of the lake and was located around a bunch of different restaurants and a lot of things to do. He could go on the roof and grill and swim in their swimming pool. The two also spent their time frequently traveling and going on a bunch of tropical vacations. However, about a year after moving in with Kristen, Brett's father unfortunately passed away so after this, Brett started having to help out around the house to help Susan figure out the administrative tasks that Bill was once responsible for. He helped her with a bunch of different chores around the house and he was doing odd jobs in exchange for money. It was also around this time that Brett actually proposed to Kristen. He gave her a princess cut diamond surrounded by a halo of smaller diamonds but he was still working a string of low paying jobs and he simply was not making enough to afford the things in life that he wanted. By 2015, Brett actually dropped out of school once again. He had been going this entire time, but when he dropped out, he didn't tell Kristen. She still believed that he had been going to school and was still working towards his degree. But he was lucky enough that by early 2016, Brett had landed a job at a tech firm in Toronto. He was finally about to start earning a real income and he could finally start getting his finances back on track. He initially told Kristen about this lucky break and he had a big celebration with his family. However, unfortunately, once this job found out about his past criminal history, they rescinded the offer. But Brett didn't tell anybody about this. He couldn't admit defeat. He couldn't admit that he failed once again. So he continued to pretend that he had this job and was continuing to pretend that he was earning this good income. He had Kristen under the impression that he was just working from home now. As all of this was happening, Brett and Kristen were excitingly planning for their wedding that they had set for September 16th, 2016. They picked Ancaster Mill, a creekside venue near Hamilton, as their venue. Then, Brett had been planning a bachelor weekend in August where he would go to a Mont Tremblant ski resort in Quebec. They had also recently hired a realtor and were starting to look at houses and were planning to move out of the small condo, making a really big upgrade. Things were really looking up for the couple and they were so excited to start this new chapter in their lives. Susan, Brett's mother, was really proud of the progress that Brett had made in his life. At this point, his mom was still under the impression that he had graduated from university and she thought that he had this big tech job. She liked his new fiance, Kristen, and she was so excited to see them get married. But with the wedding coming up, he needed more financial help from his mother. He did more and more odd jobs around the house, pretty much finding anything that he could to fix around the house and to get paid money for. But those odd jobs and extra cash can really only get you so far. He was starting to really struggle with money given that he didn't actually have this well-paying job nor did he graduate from university. So like I said, this entire time, Brett had been visiting a therapist and she advised him to be more open and honest with those closest to him, so he did. He decided that he could not continue living this lie. So he finally came clean to his mom and he told her everything that was going on. He told her that he would look for a job, but asked her for more financial help until he was able to find something. But Susan was not okay with her son continuing to lie to his soon-to-be wife. She wasn't about to just hand him the money that he had asked for. She said that he needed to tell Kristen everything that he had just told her or 
she was going to tell Kristen herself. She said that once he came clean to Kristen and she was aware of everything that was going on, she would start giving him money again. But this isn't something that Brett was just going to let happen. Kristen couldn't know anything. She would leave him if she knew that his entire life was a lie. In his mind, he was about to lose a life that he knew with Kristen and maybe he'd end up back living with his parents. So, he decided that he would do anything to prevent Kristen from finding out. Now, Brett was not allowed to own any sort of firearm since he was still on parole. So, he decided to go out and buy a crossbow because he didn't require a permit to own this and anyone over the age of 18 could purchase one. He picked out a Barnett Recruit Youth 30, which is the lightest and cheapest crossbow that you can find. Now, normally, these go for just under $300, but Brett found one cheaper and he purchased it from a secondhand store in cash so that he wouldn't leave behind any sort of evidence of this purchase. In the days that followed, Brett continued going over to his mother's house to work on different jobs around the house. One of these jobs included a total kitchen renovation that him and his brothers had all been working on. Their garage was completely filled with different debris and this big wood pile from the project, so this is where he decided to hide the crossbow. He figured that because there was so much stuff in the garage that's, you know, kind of dangerous, you don't want to be around a bunch of debris, that would be the perfect place to hide it because nobody would go in there snooping around. On the morning of August 25th, 2016, 35 year old Brett and his fiance Kristen woke up in the morning and they got ready for work. Kristen left at around 7.30 a.m. for her job as a physiotherapist and Brett continued to get ready for his fake tech job. This is the day that Brett had planned to execute his plans of taking care of his mom's threats, so he decided that he needed to come up with this whole plan to create an alibi for himself. This whole thing is so elaborate and I hope I explain it properly, but he started by opening his laptop and then he propped it against the wall with two five pound weights. Then he duct taped wooden spoons to an oscillating fan so that the spoon would touch the laptop's enter key. Then he plugged the fan's cord into a digital timer so that when this timer is activated, it will turn the fan on and then the fan will touch the enter key or on the cruiser, which was right on top of the YouTube icon so that at a certain time, it would click on the YouTube icon and open YouTube. Then he did the same thing with two other portable fans, plugging them into timers. Then he screwed them into a wooden board, which he put on the kitchen's island counter then he taped styluses to the casings of the fan. Then he taped a phone and another tablet to another wooden board so that they both faced the fans and the styluses. This time when the timers went off, it would turn on the fan and then the styluses would touch the phone and the tablet. Then each the phone and the tablet would send out pre-typed messages. One of the messages that he had planned to send was to a friend, thanking him for a real estate tip. Then the other was a message that was sent about a home repair. These timers were all set to go off at different times of the day, and then the screens were set so that they would never shut off, that they were always on, so you can change the settings on your phone so that it doesn't dim or lock or turn off. It was set so that it would always stay on while he was gone. So, of course, all of this was done so that his devices would ping as being at home all day. So, if police ever caught up with him, he would be able to point to the pings from his different devices and say that, hey, I was watching YouTube all day. I was sending out texts and emails from home all day. You know, obviously, Kristen expects him to be at home since he works from home now. So, this would show Kristen that not only was he home and he is really doing this tech job, but it would also show police that there's no way I could have committed any sort of crime because I was home all day. After setting up this whole elaborate contraption, 
He then packed a wig and a bunch of clothes into his gym bag so that he could wear them to disguise himself. Then he knew that he needed to leave his condo without being seen on any of their surveillance cameras. So he walked down the 14 flights of stairs down the condo's stairwell and then exited the building through the building's back alley. This was the route that he could take to best avoid being seen on the cameras but the alley did have some cameras, so he actually mapped out where all of the cameras were in the alley, and he figured out a way to go around them so that he wouldn't be seen on any of them. Then he boarded a train and took the train to the nearest train station near his mother's house, after that, he walked about 10 minutes until he got to her home. Brett arrived to his mother's house at around 10 a.m. that morning. Susan had been home that morning, but she actually had not planned to be home that day. She had actually planned to go to the Canadian National Exhibit that day, but Susan was stuck at home with a cold. Brett started this visit by going inside and trying to reason with his mother. He begged her not to tell Kristen and he tried showing her his perspective. But of course, this just turned into more of an argument. Susan stood her ground and told him that he needs to tell Kristen everything or else she was going to tell Kristen. As this argument started to get more and more intense, Susan called Chris, Brett's older brother, who was 42 years old at the time, and she asked him to come over and help her deal with Brett. At this point, Brett knew that there was no possible way that he was going to talk his mother out of telling Kristen, so he angrily went into the garage. Now, a crossbow definitely is not quick or easy to load. You have to cock the string back, and then you have to put in a bow bolt in place before you're able to pull it back and take your shot. He didn't have time to do any of this before his mother followed him into the garage, so instead he grabbed a broadhead bolt, which is a pretty long bolt that has three sharp edges that come together to meet a point. He grabbed this with his mother still following closely behind him, then he suddenly turned around and he stabbed his mother in the cheek and the ear with this broadhead bolt. Of course, she was just in complete shock. I mean, her son had just stabbed her, so Brett was able to grab Susan and wrestle her down to the ground in the garage. This was all happening right next to a big pile of wood flooring debris that, again, like I said earlier, was from the renovations that they were doing inside of the house. So, as they were struggling, wood pieces were falling, things were just going everywhere, and it was just a complete disaster. As they were struggling, Brett found a yellow piece of nylon rope that was laying nearby and he started strangling Susan with it and unfortunately, he did so until she died. After Susan had been killed, Brett knew that his brother Chris was on his way over, so this time, he did have time to go ahead and get his crossbow and to cock it and wait until Chris arrived. Brett then went and hid until he saw Chris step into the garage. Then Brett came up behind Chris and shot him with the crossbow in the back of his brother's neck at very close range, and Chris died immediately. After that, Brett took his brother's body and stacked it right on top of his mother's body, right behind this big pile of hardwood flooring. He then put a tarp over the bodies to hide them. At this point, he was planning on grabbing his gym bag and changing his clothes that he had put in the bag and then leaving. But as he was doing so, his 29-year-old younger brother, AJ, came home. Brett listened as AJ entered the home, and then Brett left the garage and followed AJ to the back door of the house. At that point, he had armed himself with another crossbow bolt. Brett then confronted AJ, the two struggled, and then Brett stabbed AJ in the neck with the crossbow bolt. After that, AJ ran outside into the driveway of the home, which did connect to the back door, and at that point, he collapsed on the driveway. Then, as if it couldn't get any more unlucky for this entire family, at the same time, Leland had been napping in his room, and he woke up to hear all of this commotion going on. So he ran outside to see what was happening and 
that is when he saw his younger brother AJ laying in the driveway covered in blood. So he ran back into the house to call 911 because I'm sure at this point he had no idea that anything was inside the house. He probably thought all of this happened outside. So he ran back into the house to call 911, but once again, he was just confronted with his brother, Brett. At this time, Brett attacked Leland and the two struggled. They actually had a very intense altercation that went through pretty much the entire house. They fought all the way down the hallways. They were kicking over furniture as they went. They then ended up in Leland's room and they were slammed against Leland's bedroom door. Leland also suffered a very serious head wound that left him bleeding profusely while Brett was just covered in blood from the family members that he had just executed. As this was going on, AJ crawled down the driveway towards the street and eventually in front of the house. As he did this, Leland was able to get away from Brett for long enough for him to exit the house and then run across the street and bang on a neighbor's door to ask for help. He banged on the neighbor's door as loud as he could and when they answered, he told his neighbors to call 911 because his brother was laying in the driveway and he was bleeding. He was also repeatedly telling them to make sure that the police came. He then collapsed into the neighbor's arms and he passed out. Brett did try initially chasing Leland to prevent him from going to the neighbor's house, but once he was able to get there, Brett just gave up. He grabbed a bottle of water from the fridge, didn't even close the fridge behind him, and then sat down on the stoop of the house and he sat and waited for police to arrive. By the time the first officer got to the scene, AJ was still alive, but when the paramedics got there, Brett had already died. Brett sat there calmly on the stoop and he allowed police to arrest him. He said to them, the guys in the garage are dead, crossbow to the head, it was me. After this, police headed over to Kristen's condo to make sure that she was okay because at this point, police had no idea what they were dealing with. At this time, this is when they found this entire digital alibi setup that he had rigged. But at first, police had no idea what to make of this entire setup. They saw the timers and had no idea if Brett had, you know, created a bomb that was supposed to go off at a certain time or what. So police evacuated the entire building and they called the bomb team to come and check the scene out. They unplugged the fans and the styluses before the timers had a chance to go off. Police did end up saying that these devices were set up correctly and that they would have worked properly if they hadn't dismantled them. So basically saying that they would have sent out these emails, they would have opened YouTube, they would have done all the things that Brett had intended on them doing if they didn't unplug them first. After being arrested, Brett hired a well-known criminal defense attorney in the area named John Rosen. He was known for defending accused murderers in the area. Initially, Brett was being charged with three counts of first-degree murder, but Brett's lawyer worked out a deal with the courts and he pled guilty to different charges. First, he pled guilty to the second-degree murder of his mother since he said that he didn't go there with the intent to kill her. He said that he only grabbed the crossbow when the argument got very heated, and even then, he said that he only grabbed it initially to threaten his mother with it instead of killing her with it. That wasn't his original plan. He did plead guilty to first-degree murder for his brother, Chris, since he did admit that he waited for him to arrive before killing him. Then, he pled guilty to the second degree murder of AJ because he wasn't expecting him to be home and he killed him very unexpectedly in the heat of the moment. At the hearing, Brett expressed great regret and remorse for what he had done. He said, quote, I can only begin to say how sorry I am for what I've done. The time now doesn't belong to me, but I'll make the most of every opportunity I'm afforded. He said that he's sick with grief and he apologized to everybody for what he had done. At the end of the sentencing hearing, Brett was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years 
for the charge of first degree murder. He was given two more life sentences for the murders of Susan and AJ to be served concurrently. Then he got an additional 10 year sentence to be served concurrently for the attempted murder of his brother Leland. The judge said that he respects and appreciates Brett's remorse and that he can tell that he's truly regretful. He actually said that he's a good man who had been caught up in a web of lies, which I completely disagree with wholeheartedly. I don't think he's a good man. He's a heinous murderer who violently executed three people, one after the other, but okay, judge say what you want. I don't know the full extent of Leland's injuries, but from what I've seen, he did turn out to be okay physically, but he is still suffering from immeasurable amounts of emotional trauma. He said that after seeing his entire family being slaughtered, his life is just shattered by the trauma. He suffers from severe anxiety and he struggles to even leave his home at all. He couldn't sleep or concentrate on anything in the weeks or months and probably years after the murders. He said that all he can think about is his brother laying in the driveway and taking his last breaths as he bled out. I literally cannot imagine having to see that and live with that and then on top of that knowing that your own brother is responsible. My heart goes out to Leland genuinely. My heart just breaks for that poor man. I can't even imagine being in that position with any of my siblings. My life would be shattered. Um, so my heart truly goes out to him because that is just something that nobody should ever have to go through. At the end of all of this, I do think that Brett is remorseful. I do think that he feels bad for what he did, and I do think that he acted out of desperation. However, does that excuse anything? No, absolutely not. I actually read an article that stated that Brett is a victim in his own way, and I 100% disagree. Everything that Brett did was within his own decisions. Yes, he had issues that were out of his control. He definitely had a lot of things in his life that could have caused anybody to go into a really deep depression. Nobody's arguing against that. But him choosing to hide absolutely everything from his family and those closest to him, that was his own choice. Having a life after going to jail is really difficult, but a lot of people go through that. A lot of people struggle with the looming effects that their sentence has when they're trying to better themselves and find a good job, but that's not an excuse for what he did. If him and Kristen were truly meant to be together and clearly she was perfectly fine with all of his past convictions, then he should have just told her. Obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty, and maybe she would have broken up with him, but what's that compared to losing your entire family? and spending the rest of your life in jail. It just makes absolutely no sense. This might be a little bit of a hot take, but I don't think that Brett necessarily went to his mother's house specifically to kill her. Otherwise, in my opinion, he would have went there, he would have just said hi to his mom, went straight to the garage, and without her noticing anything, she probably would have seen him and been like, hey, what's he doing here? Goes to the garage, comes out with the crossbow, and just kills her right away. I think he would have done that if he went there with the intent to kill her so that he could catch her off guard and that, you know, this whole thing wouldn't have happened. But he still obviously had a part inside of him that knew that he was capable of it. He clearly bought that crossbow with the plan to either threaten his mother with it or hurt her or kill her. I think that you know, he did truly go to his mother's house to confront her and beg her not to tell Kristen, but I think in the back of his head, he knew that if she didn't comply, that he was going to take her life so that he could prevent her from ruining his life. He knew, obviously, that there was a chance that he would need an alibi, so that's why he set up this entire elaborate rig to give himself an alibi because he knew that something might happen. So even though I don't think he went there with the intent to kill her per se, I do think that he knew that it's very possible that it could have happened. And I think deep down he knew that his mother was not just going to agree to not tell Kristen. Obviously, I don't think that he planned to kill his brothers per se, but obviously they probably also would have told Kristen about everything. Obviously, they were there to know that he was the one who killed his mom, so obviously they would have turned him in. So I think that's kind of why 
that entire thing happened. I don't think he was thinking when he killed his brothers, but again, it's not an excuse. This entire case was very interesting, like psychology-wise. I've seen articles written like questioning how did this happen? Because normally cases like this where an entire family is executed, it's either one, you know, a middle-aged or older man who kills his wife, his kids, and then himself because he's unhappy with his life and his wife and his kids. Or it's a kid or a teenager or a young adult who takes the life of their parents because of something that happened in their life. Things like that. But someone in this situation, this is just so out of the ordinary. Someone who doesn't have any sort of past history of any sort of mental health issues besides depression, it's just crazy that this happened. It's really, really unusual, and a lot of people have been trying to figure out what caused it, but I don't think there's really any answers. Clearly, something snapped in him to make him think that the only way that he was going to live his life the way that he knew it was to take out anyone who was pushing against it. I don't know what caused him to go into such a rage that he thought that taking out every member of his family would solve his problems, but he did. And I, I think at some point he just went into autopilot and it just happened. Again, not an excuse. He absolutely went there and he knew that something like that could have happened. He's at fault for his own actions. He's totally responsible for the murders, obviously. And I do think that 25 years and all these sentences to be served concurrently is far too easy on him. I don't think it's harsh enough. I don't think he should ever get out of prison. So there's that. But that's sort of how I think all of this could have happened. But again, at the end of the day, it's such a mystery. It truly, it truly is such a mystery how this happened. But at the end of the day, Brett is left without a family. He's in prison. He doesn't have a fiance. He doesn't have a family. And the only surviving member of his family probably never wants to see him or speak to him or hear his name ever again. Again, my heart absolutely goes out to Susan, Chris, AJ, and especially Leland. This shouldn't have happened, obviously, and now I hope that Brett lives every single day of his life with absolute guilt, knowing that he took the lives of everybody who loved him unconditionally. I hope Kristen was able to recover from all of this as well. I haven't heard much about her, but I'm sure she just wanted to separate herself from all of this as much as she could. So again, my heart goes out to the entire family, Kristen, and everybody who was affected by this. But either way, that is all I have for today's video, and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Do you think Brett went over to the house with the intention to kill his mother outright, or do you think it happened the way he described? What do you think of him snapping and killing his mother and his brothers? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to use the link down below and head to Berga's website and use code RachelShannonX15 to get 15% off of your order. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send your suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!